What up, Misfits? Welcome to the Misfit Heroes Podcast. My name is Chris, and together we are going on a journey. Now, Misfits, if you're just coming on board with me in a past episode, I started a series about starting a nonprofit company with the intent to document the entire process along the way. I mentioned in the intro to that episode that I'd be having guests on that are going to help me with questions and hopefully provide some insight into issues that nonprofit startups may be facing. I've had some amazing and knowledgeable guests on to help with that, and tonight's guest is no different. Mickey Desai is host of the Nonprofit Snapcast, a quick and easy to digest podcast that interviews professionals in the nonprofit space about issues and ideas that affect nonprofits specifically in their business model. The podcast is super fun and informative, and I've learned a whole lot from him. And I was stoked when he agreed to come onto the podcast as a guest. We discussed the differences between nonprofit, not for profit, and for profit business models. How his new nonprofit snapshot app is going to change the game in helping nonprofits unlock their full potential. And he gives us some fantastic insight into how nonprofit startups can gain the most traction in their infancy. I learned a lot, and I'm sure you're going to as well. So, Misfits, please welcome Mickey Desai. Playing the Misfit Heroes podcast. Mickey Desai, welcome to the show. I've been listening to the Nonprofit Snapcast for about a week now, and I love it, man. It's so informational, but I hear you do two podcasts. Is that right? Actually, I do like two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, you really are living your best life, aren't you? <laughs> I am trying, man. Chasing the dream, just, you know, trying to keep putting one foot in front of the other, make, the good, make trying to make cool things happen. Yeah, man. Yeah. So the thing about cars is your other podcast. Now, yeah. not, not to sound like Seinfeld, but what are... What is the thing about cars? <laughs> but I, I think you're right. I think the thing about cars is sort of Seinfeld, but a car show. Anything goes. It's about nothing in particular as long as it has something to do with cars. Um, and, and we cover everything from electric vehicles to muscle cars to car shows to uh, region-specific car shows. Like there's some things that happen in Atlanta, British Car Day, German Car Day. There's an Italian Car Day that we get invited to every year. Um and we just have fun, right? I mean, everybody everybody we know has a car story to tell, and and we like helping them tell that story. Plus, there's so much car culture here in the Southeast that doesn't get seen on mainstream television. Yeah. Um, and, and our dream come true is to figure out how to turn the thing about cars into some sort of television production. So we, we have our work cut out for us. We have some, some work we need to do, but, but that's the current push is how do we meet more people in the industry to, to get those connections and figure out how to properly pitch the show. Yeah. Well, so I take it, I take it you're into cars. What's, what's your favorite type of car? What's your favorite car? That's a hard question to answer because my <laughs> head does a, you know, snap every once in a while when I'm just sitting there at the coffee shop and something cool drives by. Uh, I, I, you know, if, money's no object if money is no object at all and i want a cool car just to drive around off for a daily basis i would probably get a maserati nice nice i'm a car but, guy too are you <laughs> yeah a little bit a little bit <laughs> and, and I like I like the Italian cars too because I like things yeah. that are extremely expensive to fix when they break. That's what it's I mean. so true. It's so absolutely <laughs> true. I heard something the other day. People are like, luxury cars aren't expensive to buy; they're expensive to maintain. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's absolutely the truth. But uh, and I don't know why I land on the Maserati. There's so much cool eye candy out there. You know, we saw a Bentley at lunch today, and oh, wow. uh, it just had the right curves, right? It just, it, it, it wasn't ostentatious. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't in your face luxury. It just looked nice. And, yeah. uh, so, you know, I, I don't know it, but in a more practical sense though, I think what I, what I would really had, if someone said, Mickey, here, you don't have an unlimited budget, but here, go buy what you want. I would probably get, uh, a challenger with one of the souped up engines in it. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Well, well, cars are cool and all, but we're here to talk yeah. nonprofits. So um, I'm very excited to talk to you. You know, I've learned so much from your podcast and I really like how the episodes are sort of quick, uh, easy to digest, you know, and, uh, but tell me about your show a little bit, you know, so for people that haven't heard it, what made you want to do a nonprofit podcast and when did you get into the nonprofit space as a whole? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a long and boring story, so I'm going to apologize to your listeners in advance. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but thank you for the kind words. First of all, I, I really appreciate it for the snapcast. Um, considering that I really don't have a structure or a reason to how any of those episodes go. I, I tell my guests that we're basically going to pretend we're having coffee for 15 to 20 minutes at a time. And there's a topic that we're going to cover during that time. But, uh, uh, but anyway, the whole thing started, uh, you know, my journey in the nonprofit sector started back at the year 2000, 2001. And I was coming away from corporate America and I knew I wanted to do something that fed me in a little differently than corporate America did. 
And all my friends have been telling me, Mickey, you need to be in sales. You, ne- you need to be in sales, Mickey. So I'm like, okay, fine. But you know, my personality being what it is, major extrovert that I am, I, I-, I figured that I would get into sales, but do it for the nonprofit world. And fundraising and development is sales. Mm-hmm. Um, so trying to truncate a long story a little bit, I, I did the nonprofit thing for a good long time, got really heavily entrenched in the nonprofit world here in Atlanta and, uh, became, um, the director of development for my tiny little habitat affiliate. And I became the executive director of a small, a very small nonprofit shortly thereafter. And it was those two experiences that led to my first entrepreneurial endeavor, uh, which is something I still do called the nonprofit snapshot. Um, the nonprofit snapshot is essentially a nonprofit consultancy. And I help nonprofits do things like strategic plans, uh, studies related to fundraising. I help them with technological implementation, everything from websites to databases. Um, so it's a wide variety of things that I will help nonprofits do. I try to make things ch- cheap and easily accessible um, because I know a lot of medium-sized nonprofits simply don't have the big boys budgets to do those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'm saying um too much, so forgive me. I know as an editor what kind of a nightmare that is. Uh, oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. I do the same thing. Just, just yeah. let it well, man. <laughs> cool. So, you know, the, the, the whole, the whole the snapshot thing got started with me inventing this micro assessment of a nonprofit's management practices. Um, it was especially that executive directorship that I had um, just after the Habitat experience. It, it was such a hardship to try to turn the Queen Mary, right? That organization hired me to make some cultural changes. That's specifically the language they used. And if anyone ever tries to get me to do that again with those words, I'm leaving. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, uh, but you know, when, when back in 2008, when this happened the economy collapsed and, and this organization's fundraising just disappeared, I was making a list just to try to, you know, nurse my wounds a little bit because I stood in front of that board and I said, you need to fire me and you need to fire this other person who works for the organization. And if you're going to survive this storm, you need to do it using volunteer help alone, which is exactly what they did. Um, So um, they rebranded and everything shortly thereafter. Um, But uh, so I'm nursing my wounds and I'm writing out this micro assessment and I invented this way to, to enable me to walk into a nonprofit, talk to three people and get enough data to generate a report card as to what, what does the five mile view of their management scope look like? What do they do well? What do they need to fix? And that was something we called the snapshot. Um, so to make a long story even longer, I am now turning the snapshot into an app so that I could put it in the hands of consultants across the country. And throughout the time that I've been working on the snapshot as an actual tool, the snapcast, the podcast was meant to be sort of the marketing gimmick around the snapshot, right? It was supposed to be the thing that allowed me to talk to other managers and nonprofit leaders in the field and bring them to the table. And it worked. To that end, it has worked fantastically as a, as a, as a podcast and as a marketing tool. It, in fact, the Snapcast has taken on a life of its own, and I now have this wonderful niche but national footprint of <laughs> of, a, of a nonprofit audience. It's not a very big audience. I, I wish there was another zero on the other on the end of my listener count, but uh, but every time I say, "Hey, I'm looking for a guest who can talk about blank," that person shows up, and sometimes three and four of that person shows up. Um, and even unbidden, I sometimes get more than two guest solicitations per week, and I now have enough many enough recording in the can that if I stopped recording today, I probably wouldn't have to record another episode until May of next year. So wow. uh, it's been really great. And I'm going to start doubling up the production effort just to get some of those episodes out and keep current. Um, it's been fun. It's been a really cool way to meet people all across the world. Actually, I had a, I had a session I did a few days ago. I don't know if I'm going to publish this one or not, but I had a lady in Australia and a gentleman in Austria at the same time. It's like, you know, a 13 hour time span. It's, it's actually more, <laughs> yeah, more than half the planet at that point. Right. And I'm like, how, how many people get to say they do stuff like that? So I'm very, very happy to be in that position. The show. I like it. Like I said, it's, it's short and sweet and it's very informative, you know? Um, but tell me about the snapshot a little bit. I mean, how, how does the snapshot work and how can you help nonprofits grow with that? The snapshot, you know, there are other assessments out there that measure management efficacy. Um, most of them are large and cumbersome or expensive. And mine was designed to be quick and cheap and, uh, and, and quickly just do the five mile view without doing the granular analysis. So it, it measures things like, you know, if, if I talk to three people as my data points for the organization, can all of them tell me what the mission is? you'd be surprised how many can't, right. um, you know, can all of them tell me that they have a disaster recovery plan? And if the answer is, I don't know, 
that's just as good as saying no, right? Because what good is the plan if you don't know it? Uh, And so it's stuff like that. And it'll say things like, okay, amongst these best practices, these benchmarks in the world of marketing, you guys get a B. Among these, you know, against these benchmarks in the world of fundraising, you guys get an A. So it shows them where where the things are that they may want to tweak to, to, in a very general sense, fine tune their management engine. And it, it's meant to give that consultant just a little more data where to look. And, um, you know, when I was pilot testing the thing, I did one snapshot for a mental health entity. And they thought they came to the table saying they needed a marketing consultant. We did the snapshot and it turns out they needed a lawyer. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And they, they needed a lawyer first just to be able to shore up some open areas of liability for themselves before they embarked on the marketing journey. Because when you're talking about mental health, you know, HIPAA and things like that certainly come into play before you start telling the story. And, uh, and you know, so of course, as you know, all nonprofits have to figure out how to effectively tell their story. Um, so that's that's the kind of thing it's designed to do. If it, if there's another deficiency that needs addressing first, let's talk about that. Otherwise, it allows that consultant to get armed with some information to feed their consulting work, whether it's a fundraising plan or uh, you know strategy sessions or something like that. It's basically just a thermometer. Now, is this something that any nonprofit can take advantage of on like any organization level, or is it like you know is it is it geared towards any sort of um, level of expertise? I don't have a direct answer to that question, only because the intended end user is not the nonprofit. The intended end user is the consultant. To to that end, a consultant can take the snapshot to any nonprofit and use it with them no matter what their size of their nonprofit is, no matter what their mission is. I think that once we get it up and running as an app, if we see some success with the upcoming alpha test and then the upcoming beta test, um, I would like to secure funding to make it scalable so that we would measure different entities differently. Say... An, an ecumenically run after school care program, we may want to assess their management structure differently than we would assess um, a grassroots arts entity, for instance, right? They, we may not, add, they may not like some, I actually assessed one organization that had no volunteers, no volunteers and no staff. It was just basically an organization that did events. Board members did specific things for the organization, like fundraising, securing the space to do this stuff. But uh, they didn't have a dedicated volunteer coordinator because they didn't really have a volunteer program. So, you know, they they automatically failed the volunteer management section simply because they didn't have that component. Um, so, you know, if they don't have that, I don't want to penalize them for it. So we're, we're going to figure out how to make it scalable. Um, and then there's other stuff I want to do with the snapshot once we get it up and running, but that's probably a discussion for another day. Well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit because I mean, you clearly know a lot about what you're talking about. And one of the things that popped up in a previous episode of the podcast is, you know, I talked to a lot of nonprofits. I talked to a lot of ministries, a lot of outreach programs and things like that, but basically everyone trying, everyone I talked to is trying to change their community for the positive. And the idea that I had is I want to do that myself. I've got an idea that we can talk about otherwise after the podcast or something like that um, as far as a plan of how to do that. But I'd like to do this on the podcast itself and sort of track the journey of the actual nonprofit. And, um, you know, we're still at we're still at square one for for all of this. We're at the very beginning. So my question to you is what advice, you know, knowing everything that you know, what advice would you give someone in a nonprofit startup? And it can't be don't because that's the often that's the answer I hear the most often. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my first snide answer, but yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, I mean, do you have any, do you have any suggestions yeah. for, for newbies? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, there's a blog piece I wrote and, and I wrote it a long time ago and it's still one of the most trafficked pages on my website from way back when. And it basically says, so you want to do the startup thing? Don't do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then it goes on to say, look, if you are going to do it, here's some basic things you could do first, just before you even get out of the gate. And that is to make sure you have a business plan thoroughly documented, before you even talk to your secretary of state's office about incorporation, before you even write to the IRS to get your tax exempt status, make sure that business plan is as complete and as thorough as it needs to be. And that includes two key components. That includes a competitor analysis, what other nonprofits are in your region that are looking for the same kind of funding. It includes a fundraising feasibility study so that you know 
that in your immediate social circles or geographic circles, that when you tell people about your project, that they're actually going to give you in check instead of just a handshake. So uh, those are two things you have to have um, in your business plan. Make sure that business plan is as thorough as it can possibly be. And then and even then, you know, as we all know, business plans are not hard and fast plans. A, a plan is nothing, but planning is everything. And um, uh, and some famous person is misattributed to that quote, I'm sure. But um, uh, but once you get those two pieces of information down, or perhaps even while you're getting those two pieces of information down, serve on a board first. Serve on someone else's board and do at least a complete term with them. Someone who does work similar to what you want to do. That'll give you a bird's eye governance view of what the nonprofit landscape looks around that organization as they try to fulfill their mission objectives. You'll learn all about governance. You'll learn all about leadership. You'll learn all about their fundraising struggles. Um, and it's just an education like none other. And that experience will completely feed your business planning process. Um, so I think that if you're really in startup mode and before you even try the incorporation piece, those are things that I would suggest anybody do before they start their own nonprofits. Um, once you have done that, once you have pulled the trigger and you now have a board of directors, you have your mission, um, you're starting to try to plan events to, to fuel the machine and do the work of making the world a better place. I think that the, the, the things that the organization should do first is pay really close attention to its leadership and, and try to mobilize that leadership as efficiently as possible in the beginning without creating problems. And while improving accountability, there's a ton of ongoing research that says nonprofits have a distinct shortage of leadership across the sector, meaning people will sign up to be on boards and then they don't know what being on a board means. So try to get your board members all on the same page. You know, try to get that engine to borrow a car phrase because I'm a car guy. Try to get that engine to fire on all cylinders at the right times, which means your leadership is working well together. You've got a team that likes each other and likes to do things well with each other. The fundraising committee is actually doing the fundraising, right? You actually are bringing in flesh, fresh blood from time to time to be on your board. Everything always comes back to the board with really good and running nonprofits. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I think, you know, shore up board mechanisms, shore up leadership, make sure that everybody on that board knows that they have a fiduciary responsibility to the organization and what that really means to them, right? Most people don't know what fiduciary responsibility means. So when I'm doing board trainings, I uh, there's a polite way to describe what they're supposed to do. And then there's my way to describe what they're supposed to do. <laughs> um, the polite way is if you're going to be on a board, um, bring, bring, your, bring your time, your treasures, and your talents. You know, definitely be there for the board, bring your time, bring your energies, do something to help them move their mission forward. Bring your treasures. Every board member should make a significant gift to the organization every year. Uh, and then um, bring your talents. So that is, if you are an accountant, you're on the on the on the um, shopping. You're not chopping block. That's completely the wrong phrase. But you're on the line for helping them specifically with the accounting piece. Sarbanes Oxley actually says that if you're on a board and if you have skills that are relevant to the board's mission, and if the organization screws up then you're actually more liable than the other board members is possibility of a lawsuit. So that if, uh, if you're on a board member and all of a sudden they declare bankruptcy and they declare, you know, uh, they default on a bunch of stuff. Um, and if the organization gets sued and there happens to be an accountant on your staff, well, why didn't they raise a red flag? So they're actually, you know, a little more responsible than all the other board members. Um, you know, God forbid that actually happens. So, um, so my, my way is not time, treasures, and talents. My way of saying the same thing is if you're going to be on a board, be a doer, a donor, and a door opener. So do things for the organization, definitely donate to the organization, and then open your Rolodex and invite your friends and your family and become the best evangelical ambassador you could possibly be for that entity. Treat board service as if it's a, as a, at least a part-time job, if not a second full-time job. And that's how you get organ, that's how you get a good nonprofit out of startup phase into something that's self-sustaining. You know, you're, you're very well-versed in all this. Why, you know, I need to find out why is there so little information for the nonprofit startup? Is it because nonprofits can be so diverse in their goals or is it, you know, do, do you have any clue as to why, 
there's there's so little information available to where there's such a need for personal um, contact with like a consultant or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I would counter that by saying that there's actually an abundance of information out there. People just don't know how to find it. Um, you, you, you almost can't go to a public library and find these things. You can. But there are specialized libraries throughout the landscape where you go to find things about philanthropy or about fundraising or about nonprofit management. Those those resources are out there. Certainly, there's a number, a huge number of consultants out there who will happily, you know, uh, hang a shingle to try to help you do any number of things from basic fundraising work to you know the high end strategy stuff. Um, but I think that the other thing that I notice is that that there are simply a lot of people in the world who want to make the world a better place and. And they don't understand the real nuts and bolts of what it means to do that. I've heard that. Yeah. So that's, that's my, you know, off the cuff observation, you know, and, and I, and I've met a bunch of really fine people with golden hearts who say to me, Mickey, I, I want to do this thing. I met this one lady, um, who had just been through this emotionally charged experience of her own. She had escaped a cycle of violence in her family, uh, you know, escaped domestic violence, and uh, went through recovery on her own and was, a, you know, a new person, reborn in many ways. And, and she was sitting down with me saying, Mickey, I want to do this. I want to start uh, uh, an art therapy program for women who are just getting their GEDs. And I looked at her and I said, you know, that's a great idea. Did you know that there are 10 organizations within a five mile radio of, uh, radius <laughs> of us that do at least something similar, right? Right. And maybe it's not art therapy, but maybe it is actual therapy therapy, right? And maybe it's not GEDs, but maybe it's just women and girls in general. Um, and she looked at me kind of funny and she'd simply never thought about that, you know, never thought about what it meant to document a business plan and actually treat the thing as an actual business, which all nonprofits are. Um, a, a friend of mine is famous for saying uh, a tax exempt status, a nonprofit, it, it, the word nonprofit itself is, is, is a tax status. It's not a business model. So, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. you know, yeah. So people just don't think in those terms. They're like, oh, I should be able to make the world a better place just through sheer will. It takes more than that. Right. So with that being said, you know, when you mentioned earlier, when we, when you said the, the best thing for someone to do is like a feasibility study and things like that is, do you recommend them doing that on their own or do you recommend them, you know, going to a consultant? from the get go to help out with that. I always think personally that sometimes you have to get out of the city to see the smog. So I prefer getting an extra pair of eyes on the work that I'm doing because maybe I'm just too close to it. Um, but if, if you can't, you know, if you don't have a friend who can help you get out of the gate, then you should absolutely do it yourself, do as much work as you can yourself and then get someone else to take a look at it. I've been researching the last couple days about, like I said, we're, we're trying to do this thing, um, you know, extra to the podcast as well. And I've, I've been sort of torn between nonprofit and not for profit status. And, um, I understand the difference between the two, but I mean, we can definitely discuss the difference between the two, uh, for the listeners as well. The, The difference that I understand it to be is that nonprofit is for the general good of things and not for profit is sort of the general good of the purpose that you're intending for. Am I right in that or no? Kind of. Uh, and I'm not entirely clear on the difference between nonprofit and not for profit. I can definitely tell you about management differences between a 501c3 organization and a regular for profit entity. Okay. Um, so if I can change the subject there for a little bit. Sure. I, I help, uh, uh, I, in fact, I help run. I'm one of the four partners of a technically a for profit organization that simply never earns a profit. So when we turn in our numbers at the end of every year to do taxes and we have to report dividends or profits or anything like that, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say the company exists. We make sure we pay our bills, but there is nothing left in the bank at the end of the year. Right. And um, it, this is a medical group. If I can do a shameless plug, it's Usagi Medical Group. We do uh, first aid and uh, first responder medical things, emergency responsive things for, for geeky conventions across the Southeast, anime conventions, uh, gaming conventions, stuff like that. But okay. we operate at cost. You know, Whatever we have to pay for insurance and buy supplies, that's what our customers pay us. We spend that money on insurance and supplies, and then there's nothing left at the end of the year. So we did not want that to be a 501c3 because it was not important to us to have a tax exempt status. It, uh, we, and, and, and there's something else that I'll, I'll get to in a minute in terms of creative control of the organization. But, uh, uh, so we, we just did a, a regular standard for profit incorporation. I think we're, a, I think we're an actual LLC with four partners and, um, 
that does the job for us. It was the simplest way to get things done. Um, so I'm not really sure I'm addressing your entire question. So, uh, help, help redirect me here, Chris. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's talk about the, the 501 C3 a little bit. You know, the re you said the reason that you, you didn't want to do that is because you're a for-profit business that comes up with zero profit. Do you necessarily need to start a 501 C3 to, um, to be that nonprofit status. I mean, to, to function in that, in that capacity, you're saying you don't need to do that. No, you don't. Uh, and there's two different designations here that everybody should go research with their own, their own secretary of state, wherever they live in the country, there's registering as a not, not a nonprofit company. And then there's actually getting uh, tax exempt status from the IRS. Those are two different things. Sure. Um, and so when I talk to people about doing the nonprofit thing with an actual 501c3, you know, federally awarded tax exempt status, um, anybody who wants to do that tends to not realize that they don't have creative control of the entity that they've given birth to. So this lady who wanted to do the art therapy movement for, you know, girls who were getting their GEDs, you know, she thought she would have a job waiting for her as a result of doing this. And she might have, but when you have a board of directors in place that is doing their job, uh, looking after the fiduciary, you know, looking after their fiduciary responsibility to the organization, uh, those people are in charge of governance and leadership for the organization. They're the ones who sanction the decisions that get made, not the executive director. The executive director is hired and fired by that board of people. So if I'm the guy who creates a nonprofit and I think I've got a job waiting for me as their executive director, I'm going to trust that the board does the things that are right for the organization, even if that means firing me, even if that means killing a program that I like in, ch and in favor of doing something else. They're the ones who steer the organization through its its machinations, not the executive director. That's good to know, you know. Um so when you're when you're creating these boards and things like that, I mean, how often do you see nonprofits that the board is uh, Jimmy, my brother-in-law, and my uncle Joe, and you know, I mean, you know, when when you're sort of networking with these people, is there something in particular that you would look for as a leadership quality for these people, or is it really just the people that you meet and people that you know that you think would be a good fit for yeah. the organization? Yeah, I thankfully haven't seen many nonprofits that try to stack the boards with their family members. I, I know that they exist and they always, uh, whenever I hear about them, I raise an eyebrow. But uh, uh, when I'm look and when I'm talking to nonprofits about the people that they should look for for their boards when they're doing board recruiting, um, I, I think all good board members first start with some sort of passionate interest in the subject matter. Um, there was an entity here in Atlanta. There still is an entity here in Atlanta. They do um, they do work for the visually impaired. And when I spoke to them some years ago, they said they specifically recruited people who were either visually impaired or had family members who were visually impaired. So they had a direct connection to the cause. You know, I, I recently served a few years on the Georgia River Network Board. So the vast majority of the people on that board are folks who like to get out in their canoes and like to explore rivers and uh, and are passionate about water causes across the state in general. Um, so start with that passion and then and then look at skill sets after that. Okay. Um, so if you know, I think it's always a good idea to have a huge diversity of skill sets at the leadership table. And that includes lawyers and accountants. It includes business people. It includes um, people who work in the social sector. Uh, diversity is, of course, a huge thing for nonprofit boards these days, nonprofit programs in general. Um, so I think that if you look at skills, that's a, a good way to start uh, at least having a map towards the people that you want to be targeting that are on your board. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, well, I was listening to you earlier and you were mentioning the app and things like that. I mean, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, when, when do you expect to go live? Are you going to do a beta test of any of this stuff? Or, I mean, wh what's, what's sort of your, your upcoming things for the app? Um, the short answer is I have no idea what's going on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, but don't, seriously, don't we all right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, the, but but seriously, I I, I the, the the app the alpha test is ready to go. I just have to pull the trigger. I've got um, three, maybe four people who are going to help with the alpha test just to get the uh, um, just to get the thing rounded out and make sure that it's usable. Um, I'm sure the UX needs some work. You know, usability stuff needs work. But you know, after the alpha test gives me a thumbs up or a thumbs down on whether or not we should go to the next phase, then I'll have to tweak it a little bit. 
I'm, I'm debating whether or not I want to seek external funding to take it to its next level. Um, if there's a way to, to not do that, I would like to, to do that. Cause again, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not generally a control freak, but, but I don't want to give away 51% of the pie in order to make something work. And, um, and so that's my fear. And so we'll, we'll take a look at what my options are. Once we get that first level of data, I expect once the alpha is done, uh, and once we implement the feedback from that run, that the beta test will follow very quickly thereafter. And then, in fact, the the rolling beta may actually be the rollout to the larger audience. You know, we may we may just say, hey, uh, you know, if you're going to be a first time user, your annual license to use this thing is going only going to cost you. And I'm making these numbers up, so don't hold me to them. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're you're if you're a first time user, your your annual license is only going to cost you fifty bucks instead of a hundred. Right. Um, so, and then, you know, we just keep collecting data, keep changing the thing as, as we get good feedback and trying to make the tool as usable as possible to all those folks. Well, I'm looking forward to it. It sounds like a really cool, you know, a really cool idea, uh, right from the get go, but I, I, I'm, I'm really happy to have talked to you. I'm glad you took the time to sit down and talk with me. I mean, as expected, I knew you were going to have a whole fund of information to tell me <laughs> so um you know how can people uh, how can people find you on the internet and you know where can they find the snapcast and where can they f- do you have social media anything like that tell me your contact information sure very very thank you for doing that and and thank you for having me as your guest i've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation i think that you know any one of these things we could spend an hour talking on each individually but uh but in the interest of time yeah folks can find me very easily on linkedin just search for mickey desai uh, m-i-c-k-e-y D E S A I, uh, the nonprofit snapshot is very, that website is simply nonprofit snapshot.org and the snapcast, um, you can find that at nonprofit snapcast.org. That website has all the ways listed. You could find the podcast. It's on Apple podcasts. It's on Google podcasts. Uh, I think stitchers picked us up. I'm pretty sure we're on Pandora and Spotify. Um, but uh, don't judge me too harshly in some of my recent episodes. Things got out of hand with one of them, and we just we just went completely off the rails with one conversation. We started talking about subject A and ended up talking about subject C or D, and I'm like, wait, we have to come back and re- reform that. So anyway, it's <laughs> it's all there. We have a good time on the show, and uh, and I'm always looking forward you know, to getting new guests and meeting cool people. So if anyone has any interest in, in talking more nonprofit shop with me, all they have to do is drop me a line via the website or on LinkedIn, and I'll look forward to talking to them. Awesome. Well, Misfits, go check Mickey out. I mean, he's he's a very he's a wealth of information. I've I've learned so much from his podcast already, and I'm sure I'm going to learn a whole lot more in the future. Um, we're winding down towards the end of the podcast, and at the end of every show, uh, I like to ask my guest one question. It's in two parts. So, what was the last goal that you completed, and what's the next goal that you want to set for yourself? Oh goodness. And there's always a pause whenever people ask that. It's true. It's true because you're like, okay, goodness, am I am I just slacking off and not completing any of my goals? And do I need more <laughs> coffee in the morning? And what am I doing with my life in general? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <right. You> just- <laughs> You just, you just have that, you just have that, uh, internal crisis, you know, whenever I ask that, I, I see people's face, they're like, what deer in the headlight, but, but, um, but it can be anything. You know, I had, I had people, uh, talk about their business goals. I had, I had one guy say he wanted to catch a sturgeon. So, I mean, you know, whatever, oh, whatever's good for you. <laughs> that's cool. So, uh, so again, repeat your, your two part question to me. I want to make sure I'm framing it correctly. Last goal that you completed and what's the mm-hmm. next goal that you want to set? Ooh, okay. So the last goal I completed was I actually finished a prototype of a board game that I'm trying to test. So uh, it, it exists. Um, my wife is helping me get it painted and colored because it's just made from cardboard at this point. We have no no professional spit and polish put on it yet. But right. uh, uh, so that at least it exists in a physical sense. And we're starting to do the process of just getting it out to our friends so they could play test it and see if it's worth pushing. Um you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I kind of hope it's worth pushing. I hope people have fun with it. On the other hand, if it sucks, I hope they tell me that so I can stop wasting my time on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but the next goal I think I need to pay attention to, at least just from, you know, that that assortment of purely creative things that feed me and, and not just a job, right? I think I, I think I would like to put a lot more energy into figuring out how to take the thing about cars to some sort of video or television presence. I think that's the next the next big thing that's on my plate. Hey, well, if you need any help, let me know. I'll be happy to help you out, man. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the kind words too. I really appreciate your feedback. And uh, if anyone has any suggestions on how to make the Snapcast 
better or more fun, I'm, I, I'd like to hear that from folks as well. Definitely, definitely. Well, I definitely, I think, I think the the show itself is is fun as well. I mean, you would be surprised how hard I'm sure it could be to make a <laughs> podcast about nonprofits like really interesting. <laughs> but but uh, but yeah, you do a great job. And I mean, I, thanks again for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. Tell me more about this board game though. Now I'm intrigued. What's so? Is it like Mousetrap or is it like uh, is it like Pictionary? Like what what's what's up with this board game? You know, I don't know what to call it. Um, the whole idea started last Thanksgiving. So two Thanksgivings ago, um, where I was watching my in-laws play the game of sorry, right? Okay. The good, good old fashioned game of sorry. And I'm a nerd and I'm a geek and I admit it. So I'm sitting there watching them play the game and I th- start thinking out loud to myself. I'm like, what, what would happen if you combined sorry plus uno? And I don't know why these thoughts came into my head. But some smart ass at the table said, could you do it in 3D? And I'm sure he was just being facetious, facetious right? And uh, <laughs> and I looked at him and my brain just exploded. And I'm like, yes, yes, I can do it in 3D. <laughs> and so that's where the whole thing took off. And now the resulting game is nothing at all like Sorry and nothing at all like Uno. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, well, it, yeah. so- it sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I, I thought I was going to try to make it collaborative and all my friends at the table who they know that I hate games that pit players against each other. Right. They, they oh. know that I like Steve Jackson's Munchkin game is designed to make people angry. I'm convinced of it. Right. Um, <laughs> so they, they're like, Mickey, why have you done this? Cause this game is completely cutthroat, right? It's just, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but so far the feedback seems to be good. And uh, I just, you know, I just want to iron out the rules and get it finished and see if it's worth pursuing. Yeah. Well, that's, that sounds like a really cool hobby to be into is creating your own, uh, creating your own board game. You know, I, I will say I'm the same way with ultra competitive games like that to this day i am almost 40 years old i've never completed a game of monopoly never not <laughs> one it's up in the air and you know there's, there's little there's little red houses are flying across the room it's so true <laughs> yeah monopoly becomes tornado that's what it is that's how i play monopoly <laughs> let's play tornado okay yeah right, right. <laughs> awesome well uh well mickey this has been a lot of fun thank you for coming on the show and talking to me i'm really excited to hear what you got coming out next so um so thanks again for doing this and i really appreciate your time and um i'm gonna go ahead and wrap this guy up misfits thank you again for listening and have a great evening thanks chris hope we can do it again yes sir Well, Misfits, we did it. That's our episode. I want to thank you so much for listening, and thanks again to our sponsors. If you want to support any of our sponsors, there are affiliate links in the Sponsors tab of our website over at www.misfit-heroes.com. You can also find links to all of our social media there, so follow us for immediate up-to-date info about the podcast. Please, if you enjoy this podcast and you want to help me out, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button down below so you're notified of new episodes as they're released and make sure to leave a rating or review of the show on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Truly Misfits, I love you. Thank you so much for listening. Until the next episode, be kind, love one another, and be a hero.